Who is this man? Millions of people today ask that question, and John's time wasn't any different. Early in the series, Mike talked about something John says at the end of his book. In John chapter 20, verse 30 through 31, John writes this, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John's saying he has an agenda. That when he became a follower of Jesus, he did not follow Jesus because of blind faith. John followed because of what he saw and what he heard. And what he saw and what he heard convinced him that Jesus was the Messiah. And once he was convinced Jesus was, was his Messiah, he placed his faith in Jesus as his Messiah. Today we bump into the fourth sign in the series, the feeding of the 5,000. And it's the most popular or most famous or maybe most well-known story uh, in the Bible. Uh, inconveniently for me, it's in all four Gospels, so the homework for this sermon was time-consuming. Well, we'll be in John chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. So while you flip, scroll, find a way to get there, and if you don't want to, it'll be on these screens. Let me give you some context. Last week, we left off with Jesus in Jerusalem, where he and his disciples began to journey north for about five to seven days to the Sea of Galilee. They get on a boat, they go to the northernmost part of the shore, and by this point, they're about 100 miles away from Jerusalem. Many people are in this crowd who have never seen Jesus or heard him before, but now that Jesus is in their region, and while Jesus is close, they want to be close. They have an agenda. They want to see the miracle worker perform miracles, or if nothing else, catch one of his tricks. Starting in John chapter 6, verse 1, after this, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee. A huge crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was performing by healing the sick. Jesus went up a mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now, the Passover, a Jewish festival, was near. So when Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming toward him, he asked Philip, where will we buy bread so that these people can eat? He asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. So Jesus turns around, and here comes this crowd from the distance, and the text says that Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down. And then John, before he continues the story, John says, By the way, you, the reader, need to know that the Jewish Passover festival is near. This is really, this is an important piece of context because it kind of demonstrates or give us, gives us uh, information on how the passage and the crowd responds later on. And you might recall that the Passover was the Jewish festival uh, celebrating the time where God uh, delivered the nation of Israel from the nation of Egypt. And in the first century, Passover was an annual reminder to the Israelites that they needed another Moses or another Joshua or another Judah Maccabee. They needed somebody who could unite and militarize the nation and throw the Romans off their land. After all, the land did belong to them. God had promised them this land. This was their land, and as long as their land was occupied, it was a sign of God's judgment. And the Israelites were ready to be done with that. Now, the feeding of the 5,000 is a really neat story, because it's in all four Gospels. Each building on the other, each adding to the other. John's Gospel jumps right into the sign. Why? Because John has an agenda. John is trying to answer the question, who is this man? Matthew, Mark, and Luke all include this detail that John leaves out. Matthew 14, 8 through 12 reads this. Prompted by her mother, she answered, Give me John the Baptist's head on here on a platter. Although the king regretted it, he commanded that it be granted because of his oats and his guests. So he sent orders and had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. Then his disciples came, removed the corpse, buried it, and went and reported to Jesus. Mark 6, 27 through 29 reads, the king immediately sent for an executioner and commanded him to bring John's head. So he went, beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When John's disciples heard about it, they came and removed his corpse and placed it in a tomb. Luke 9, 9, I beheaded John, Herod said, but who is this I hear such things about? Jesus was human and Jesus had just healed someone. 
He just dealt with religious elites who didn't really understand what it meant to follow God. He had just finished a teaching seminar on his divinity. Now he crosses the, the Sea of Galilee, followed by a crowd who just wants to see more from him. And so Jesus sits. And I want you to understand that Jesus also just received news that his friend had just been beheaded. That John the Baptist and Jesus, they were close. They weren't just friends, they were cousins. They'd grown up together. John the Baptist was incredibly loyal to Jesus. John the Baptist was the ride or die for Jesus. John the Baptist was all about Jesus. He baptized Jesus. And now Jesus gets the news that John the Baptist has died. And Matthew 14, 11 through 13 reads this. His head was brought on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. Then his disciples came, removed the corpse, buried it, and went to report it to Jesus. When Jesus heard about it, he withdrew there from there by boat to a remote place to be alone. When the crowds heard this, they followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus heard about what happened to John the Baptist, his response was to withdraw, go somewhere private, to be alone. See what's happening? Jesus wanted some alone time. He's just lost a friend. People see where Jesus is going, and instead of giving him this alone time, they follow him. Jesus just wanted to be alone, to grieve, to breathe, to process. Let's pick back up in John's account. John 6, 7 through 11 reads, Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them to have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. So they sat down. The men numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also with the fish, as much as they wanted. There are three major interpretations over this section. The first interpretation is this. Jesus and the disciples, they had anticipated something of this nature. They anticipated an episode like this. So in preparation for a moment like this, they took a bunch of bread, a bunch of fish, and they buried it in a cave or dug a giant hole and hid it in that hole. That's interpretation number one. Interpretation number two is when Andrew talks to the boy who had the five loaves and the two fish, everyone sees how generous the boy is. And so it's like, Everyone felt compelled to give what they also had or what they also brought. It's kind of like this miracle of paying it forward that took place. That's more so ad hoc, in my opinion, you know, a non-evidence-based assumption. But those two interpretations aren't what anyone who was there said what happened. Which leads me to the third interpretation, is that Jesus performed a miracle. Or as John puts it, a sign. Let's pick back up in verse 12. When they were full, he told his disciples, collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they collected them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. Let's look at these numbers real quick. There are five loaves, two fish, 12 baskets left over. And that is consistent across all four of the gospels. Five loaves, two fish, 12 baskets. There's a study called numerology, and it addresses, it looks at the patterns and relationships between numbers and letters throughout the Bible. Now, what the five represent, what the two represent, and what the 12 represent, I just want to say, I, I have no idea. I know, I, I don't know. There are a lot of theories. The numerology is a sticky study in general. One could argue that the 12 baskets left have to do with the 12 tribes of Israel and poetically saying that Jesus provides for all of Israel. You could say that's there, um, but I don't know. It sounds a little ad hoc. Uh, but this is what's neat about eyewitnesses. You get details like the green grass, the groups of people, descriptions of how people get from point A to point B. You get five loaves, two fish, 12 baskets. The descriptions are so specific when it comes from eyewitnesses. And that speaks to the historicity of this account. Here's something that Matthew includes in his gospel that John doesn't. When he went ashore, Matthew 14, 14, when he went ashore, he, Jesus, saw a large crowd and compassion in, on them and healed their sick. 
This sets the framework for Matthew's section. This is the beginning of our episode. Earlier, we talked about how right before the miracle, Jesus learns about his cousin's death. We talked about how Jesus wanted to be alone. But because of the talking and the interest and the rumors, Jesus was followed. Can you imagine, in one of your worst moments, where you just want some privacy, to have some time to process and to heal, and you're bombarded with people who just want something for, from you? People with their own agendas? Jesus needed time and didn't get it, but still felt compassion and healed their sick. This is probably the actual miracle. Forget multiplying food and defying physics. Jesus had a terrible day and didn't lose his cool. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be compassionate in that moment. That'd be the last thing I would want to do. And for a lot of us, we look at compassion as kind of like sympathy, like saying, oh, I feel bad, that sucks, that, I'm sorry you're going through that, and doesn't really go much further than that. But compassion is used a lot in the Bible. When the writers of the Bible use the word compassion, they use this yucky-sounding word called splognitsomai, splognitsomai. Now, in this, in this time, in this archaic and ancient time, splognitsomai had a lot to do with understanding how the human body worked, specifically the lower region where one's bowels are. And the idea is movement of bowels and how when you feel that, you want to move in a direction safe to get rid of said movement. And so the writers of the Bible, they use splognitsomai to urge the reader to understand when you feel compassion, it elicits a physical response, much like your bowel movement. The Bible's fun sometimes. And so have you ever felt that kind of compassion? The type of compassion that elicits a physical response, strong emotions that bring a physical response. Christian author Brendan Manning wrote this in his book, The Signature of Jesus. He wrote this, if we indeed, if, uh, if indeed we lived a life in imitation of his, our witness would be irresistible. If we dared to live beyond our self-concern, if we refused to shrink from being vulnerable, if we took nothing but a compassionate attitude toward the world, if we were a counterculture to our nation's lunatic lust for pride, place, power, and possessions, if we preferred to be faithful rather than successful, the walls of indifference to Jesus Christ would crumble. A handful of us could be ignored by society, but hundreds, thousands, millions of such servants could overwhelm the world. Christians filled with this authenticity, commitment, and generosity of Jesus would be the most spectacular sign in the history of the human race. The call of Jesus is revolutionary. If we implemented it, we could change the world in a few months. There's a documentary about a man named Lee. Lee and his wife raised a son for 20 years with cerebral palsy. And after that experience, they decided to create what they called drop boxes. They look like little mailboxes all across Seoul, South Korea, so that mothers who are struggling with unwanted pregnancies could have a safe place to drop them off instead of killing them. And if you do nothing this week, if I could encourage you to just carve out two hours and watch this documentary, it'll be some of the best two hours that you spend. But what you're going to see is that Lee and his wife are now currently parents to 20 children with mental and or physical challenges. They bathe them every day. They feed them every day. They rock them to sleep. And every day they tell them this, we love you, you are dearly loved, and you bring us great joy. Children who might not ever hear someone say that get to hear that. Children who might not ever get to feel or understand the love of a parent are experiencing the love of a parent. And here's the next best part about this documentary. The young American filmmakers who made the documentary all pledged their lives to Jesus. They all decided to go to church. They all decided to get baptized because they'd never seen sacrificial love like this before. Brendan Manning was right. If we did what Jesus told us to do, the world would take note, and things could change quickly. Now, Jesus was clear. He told us we were to take care of the sick. We were to visit people in prison. If a child doesn't have a home or a mom or a dad, give them a home, become a parent to them. 
If you see a widow or a widower, someone who's lost their spouse, be especially considerate of them. If someone's without food, shelter, or clothing, make sure you give them those things. You've probably experienced this. When people come and bring their problems to us, often they're thick, and they're layered, and they're complicated. So how do we start? What do we do? What do we think? I think we do what Jesus did. Jesus understood that when people are at their worst, we give them our best. This is Henry LaGuardia. Some of you have flown into an airport named after him. He is considered to be one of the most beloved mayors in the New York City history. And the reason wasn't the way he governed, but the way he judged. And at night, he held night court. And in 1935, on a cold winter night, an older woman was brought in who had stolen a loaf of bread. She was accused of stealing it, and so he listens to this case. And the people who, were own, who owned the grocery store refused to drop the charges. So by law, LaGuardia was forced to fine her $10, which in 1935 had the purchasing power of $218. She immediately begins to cry. And she explained that she was a widow. Her husband was dead, and she was taking care of two grandchildren that no one in the family wanted. LaGuardia reaches into his back pocket, pulls out his wallet, and without hesitation, hands her $10. And he says, take this, I want to cover the fine for you. But then he does something no one expects. He finds everyone in the courtroom 50 cents for living in a city where an older woman had to steal bread to survive. That woman not only walked out with her fine paid, but she walked out with $47 in her hands. When people are at their worst, we give them our best. Let's pick back up in John chapter 6, verse 14. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said, this truly is the prophet who is to come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force and to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. By the end of the section, by the end of our episode, the crowd realizes who Jesus is. And it was perfect timing, right? It's almost Passover. It's almost time to get the people off our nation. It's almost time. The crowd wanted to have Jesus give them what God promised them. But the crowd wanted something that was different than what Jesus wanted. Now remember, John has an agenda. John's agenda was to show that Jesus is the Messiah. That Jesus gave his best when people were at their worst. That Jesus wanted more for people than from people. We're going to get ready for our time of communion. Now, I'm about to read you guys a quote that is like four pages long. So bear with me. It's fantastic. But if you haven't yet, please grab communion from the back of the auditorium. Uh, Several weeks ago, um, Mike prepped me with, uh, hey, Kyle, I'm going out of Florida, going out of town, I'm going to Florida. Um, Next in the sequence is the feeding of the 5,000. Can you, can you read it? Can you do this? And I was like, you would give me the one with the most homework. Because again, this passage has four gospels all adding to it. So naturally, I panicked. And much like anyone who is a millennial, when you panic, we do things to distract ourselves from the things we need to do. So I went to my digital library that I've been needing to clean out for the last three years and decided to clean it out. Well, I found a book that I used to read whenever I needed a reminder of God's goodness. And it's a book called Through the Gates of Splendor. And it tells the story of five young missionary men and their wives who went to Ecuador in the 1950s to share the story of Jesus with a headhunting cannibalistic tribe known as the Alca Indians. One of the men who went was a Wheaton graduate, a brilliant, intelligent guy. His name was Jim Elliott. Handsome star athlete, had full rides to the grad school. Might remind you of me if you read this book. (laughs) I had to. Um, Well, Jim gives it all up. He and his wife moved to Ecuador with their young daughter. And he said this in in his journal before he contacted the Alca Indians. He wrote and prayed these words. God, give me faith that will take sufficient quiver or fear out of me so that I may sing over the Alcas. 
Father, I want to sing. And one of his partners was a pilot and an engineer by the name of Nate Saint. And Nate flew a little Piper plane with all five of them. They landed on the beachhead right outside of the Alka tribe to make contact. And for three days straight, they just shouted into the jungle. They landed on the beachhead, or I'm sorry, hoping that the Alka Indians would hear them. Well, they did. And a group of 25 Alka men flooded onto that beachhead with spears, bows and arrows, and knives in hand. These five missionary men held pistols and rifles because they'd gone hunting earlier. So they were capable of defending themselves. But the missionary men, they all laid their weapons down on that beachhead sand. And they said, we come in peace. We mean you no harm. We love you. And they said this, we would rather you kill us than us kill you. And the Alcas took that literally. And they killed these five young missionary men, threw their bodies into the river, and they ran away. Now word gets back to the young missionary women, these wives who had little kids, that their, that their husbands, all their husbands had been killed. Their bodies were thrown into a river, and one of them says, the first thing we must do is pray. So they stand up babies in their arms, and they start praying. Then in the journal, they write about how at that moment, they start to sense God saying to them, the mission isn't over. There's still a headhunting, cannibalistic tribe that doesn't know about my love. And so these women start to trek into the middle of the jungle, and they make contact with the Alcas. And to their surprise, they're welcomed warmly. They're shocked by that because they're giving them hospitality right after they murdered their husbands. And so they asked them, why are you welcoming us? You just killed our husbands, our partners. And the men who killed their husbands said, as we retreated from that sandbar and ran up the hill in the jungle, we heard singing over the tops of the trees. And then that singing chased us and followed us all the way back to our tribe. We just want to know, where did those voices come from? Famously, Elizabeth Elliot says this, we can tell you. One of the little boys who lost his dad was Steve Saint. He was three years old when this happened. His mom, Steve Saint's, um, Nate Saint's, or I'm sorry, Steve Saint, the son, his mom and his aunt moved into the middle of the tribe, and they gave them an alphabet. They taught them how to read and write, exposed the Bible to them and the love of Jesus. They spent decades living among them. And during those decades, while Steve Saint was 12, Minkaya, the man who was speared, the man who speared his dad, baptized Steve and his sister in the same river where they discarded the bodies. That's grace. That's grace. Well, Steve continued to live in the jungle for the next 30 years. And one of the things he would do is he would take and lead American anthropology students into these primitive tribes so that they could study them. And he didn't tell them that he was a missionary. He just kind of went under the guise of a translator. And one time he led 29 American PhD students from the University of Chicago through those jungles. And they got to the Alka tribe. They sat down, had a campfire, and they ate. And this is Steve's translation between the students and the tribal leaders. One of the American students said, hey, before we came here, I was doing research. And I remember reading about American missionaries who were killed down here. Uh, would these people know anything about that? Well, Steve kind of smiled and didn't want to break their confidence, and so he just translated that to Minkaya. Minkaya stood up and said to the American students, "Yeah, I was one of those missionary, or I was one of those tribal leaders that killed those five missionaries." Missionaries. And Steve said the students' eyes widened, and they asked, "Well, what's made the difference?" And Minkaya went on to present the gospel, saying, "Jesus died." Then three years later, he rose, and that love has changed how we live. And then Steve stood up and hugged Minkaya and explained to the American students that this man killed my dad, threw his body into a river, and then baptized me in that river, baptized my sons in that river. That river has represented death to me my entire life, but Jesus represents life to me. And that night, they baptized 20 of the 29 PhD students on that trip in the same river in the middle of the jungle in Ecuador. Steve would go on in life to become friends with a Christian singer, Stephen Curtis Chapman. Maybe you've heard that name. Well, Chapman and his wife adopted a little girl from Ecuador, and they started a fund so that other Americans could adopt children from South America. 
The Alca, uh, one day, Chapman was with the Alka tribe with Steve Saint. And as he was introducing them, the Alkas asked Chapman if he would play a song because they heard he was a musician. So he pulls out his guitar, he starts playing a song, four or five lines in, Minkaya stands up among all the other men. And the other men are freaking out, they're shouting, they're crying, and Steve Saint's trying to figure out what's going on, and finally Minkaya says, that's the song. That's the song we heard that day, sung over the trees. And now we're hearing it again, that's the song. And Steve Saint said this in the journal, and it gives me shivers whenever I read it. When I was a boy, I cried over the loss of my dad, but now I see it well. Powerful stuff, right? I know that most of us are never going to adopt 20 children with physical or mental challenges. The majority of us are never going to be asked to pay the fines of a destitute widow or rescue an entire South American tribe. And I know those examples are extreme, but they all illustrate one point. And that is, if you are a follower of Jesus, you have to be prepared at any given moment to love anyone that God puts in your path. And with the feeding of the 5,000 fresh in our minds, and with the concept of biblical compassion fresh in our minds, I could summarize Jesus' mission statement with two verses. Matthew 20, verse 28, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. Jesus always loved and served everyone. And when people were at their worst, Jesus gave them his best. Earlier, we asked a question that millions of people asked today, and millions of people asked during John's writing. Who is this man? Having observed and having read these first four signs, I'm confident that we know the answer to that question. Who is this man? This man's name is Jesus, and he's the Messiah. He's the man who wants more for you than from you. Let's pray. You can take communion. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for an opportunity to gather, Lord. Thank you for community, the blood and sacrifice.